All right, welcome everybody today to the Learn With Lowell show. I'm your host, Lowell. As many of you know, we talk to experts, scientists, and artists every week. Uh, today, we're joined with George Church, which is interesting in particular because this marks when this episode is going to go up in uh, the beginning of March. It will mark the beginning of my fifth year doing the podcast, and George was there during the first year. So I just want to, I think that's pretty cool. And George has a, a huge rap sheet that would probably take me an hour and a half just to say it. Um, but and people should know it, but I'll have like a screen uh, rolling down <laughs> his his, his uh, history and background. But uh, George, welcome back to the show. Uh, it's great to be back. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh, so first question is, uh, so I, I, I was sitting wondering, what is it like to be you with all the things that you're doing and all the, the pressures that you have to do a great job, even just the stuff you put on yourself? And so I was wondering, uh, how often do you think and just like take a step back and think about how um, you went from like, just a, a regular scientist to the point where you are now where the measure of your impact is in millions if not billions of lives over the course of like 10 years 20 years like the, the impact of your work is just so significant and maybe that that maybe that's the per, one of the purposes of humility is so you don't think about that <laughs> stuff too much uh i mean i certainly do feel a responsibility to to take you know whatever uh education and opportunities have been provided and turn them into something that's, you know, pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just, to, I think that's a great opportunity to jump in with a fan question. Um, so I'll just read this verbatim because I suck at uh, par paraphrasing. So George is involved in multiomics, gene editing, gene therapies, epigenetics, AI <laughs> delivery, like I said, your draft sheet. Uh, do you think that we have the whole picture or a relative whole picture of biology, or do you think there's still unknowns to be discovered in terms of biology or rejuvenation, that type of stuff? Well, I'm guessing the question is about big unknowns. So there are obviously yeah, many, yeah. millions of little unknowns to be known to, to, that, that will get pe people excited. I mean, it, uh, millions of things that will get the public excited even. So, so not that little. But really big things, uh, I, 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 I would have to say that uh, a lot of that will, a lot of the really big things in the future will be synthetic rather than analytic. Mm. That is to say, there's a finite number of things to be discovered, and we discover them kind of in, in order of their importance. Like importance could be abundance of a species on the planet or uh, pathological impact on humans, that sort of thing. And so, so what happens, it comes kind of a successful approximation where we've gotten everything. But in terms of synthesis, there's no limit. I mean, we, you know, mm -hmm. until we know how to, you know, use synthetic biology to create new universes, we're not, we're not anywhere done, anywhere near done. So uh, I think there's a lot of big surprises in the future and, and some of them will be, will be reading and some of them will be writing. A lot mm -hmm. of them will be writing. The, uh, there's a, a great Neil deGrasse Tyson quote where it says, like, the more you know, the more the surface area of your ignorance expands. <laughs> and so it, is there is there an area in particular that you feel, not in a negative way, but like ignorant of, like, you're like, wow, you know, like, there's so much I don't know about it in terms of like, you know, biology and synthetic biology. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there, there my, my uh, ignorance surface area is expanding at the speed of light, I think. <laughs> I mean, so. It's, uh, I think the biggest thing we don't know anything about is, and that includes me, is uh, extraterrestrial life. It, mm -hmm. it, it has the biggest delta between there may be zero <laughs> to there may be hundreds of billions of, uh, of life uh, planets, planets with life like ours and not like ours. So I think that's the probably the, the biggest unknown. I don't think we'd be completely shocked to find that it's zero or completely shocked to find out that it's trillions of stars and planets. Um, but the details will, will probably surprise us, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like the weirdest thing is if we were to go out into space and then like, and it's not like so far where you, uh, I think like mathematically, like if you go far enough, you start seeing the same things as ourselves or something like how the math works but uh if we go like the next star system and like everyone looks like the same as us that'd be so weird it's like we must have been like seated somewhere or something yeah well panspermia is a yeah uh, is a likely mechanism uh we know that there have been you know many thousands of rocks that have passed between earth and mars uh, over time some of those may have contained early life forms some of which may have survived uh but 
But yeah, if we go far enough away, uh, the chances of contact are extraordinarily small. And so they'd be independent. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so you have many different projects that we you know, have alluded to. Is there something that you're working on right now that you're particularly excited about? Like you, you have, you have so much on your plate, but at the same time, um, like not, not even like, yeah. Is there something in particular that you're working on that you're like, wow, this is really cool. Like you're like really like, you know, the difference between like, I'm like, you know, checking boxes versus like, you're really excited about developing something. Yeah. I have a tendency to stay away from checking boxes and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and incremental stuff if I possibly mm -hmm. can. Uh, yeah. Uh, every now and then you're, you, you know, a previous revolution, either from my lab or some other one just demands uh, applications or incremental, you know, big incremental things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in fact, some of our biggest incremental, our, sorry, our biggest changes have been, you know, the product of lots of increments, you know, for example, a reduction in cost of sequencing by 20 mm -hmm. million fold was the product of a bunch of two folds, uh, maybe came in every few weeks or months. Um, but to your question about what uh, it's a, it's a popular question is like, which of your kids do you like the best? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I would say probably the one that is most impactful is, you know, when the genie gives you one wish, you ask for more wishes. And so the hmm. equivalent for science is uh, asking for more years of research, hmm. more youthful, healthy years. Uh, and, and so we have a number of related projects, both in my lab and in my uh, alumni uh, companies that uh, are aimed at, at um, you know, longer, healthier um, years. So that's, that's one. Another one that very, that I've been excited about for decades is um is recoding or you know multiplex editing and recoding of genomes so that we can from among other things make organisms that are resistant to all viruses and that finally paid off this year we have the first example of an organism that we think is re resistant to all viruses uh, and and uh and we tested this by doing you know field work getting a bunch of new you know thousands of new phages and and having very sensitive assays for for replication and, and found none. So, um, so that's another one. Uh, and there are plenty of plenty more. Uh, you know, the, yeah. the, getting a code for differentiation, or is a code that tells us how to get to any place in development, both young and old, backwards and forwards. Uh, I think we're making progress on that. So that's very exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. Sequencing I, I everybody on the planet is another one. Uh, mm -hmm. and I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. How, um, with the improvements in uh, sequencing, what would be the cost of sequencing 8 billion people? Like, is it, is that actually like doable? Uh, it's, uh, it's totally doable. And the, 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 the cost, uh, let's say that, let's say the, the cost of an item depends on how much you get back. Right. So it's like, mm, yeah. you, know, you get a, you get a, uh, um, kickback or something like that, it, or you get or you have an investment and then you get a return on an investment. And my estimate right now is the the the, the genomes are about three hundred dollars each now for a very high mm. quality diploid genome, which is not the original genome project, uh, which is not diploid. Uh, anyway, it's about three hundred dollars. It'll probably be a hundred dollars within a year or two. Um, but the return on that investment is on the order of $10,000 or more on average. So for some people, you'll get nothing back. For other people, you get a million dollars back uh, in savings uh, for, the, for the healthcare system, whether that's a mm. government system or insurance system or some combination, that's the return on investment. So actually, it wouldn't cost anything to sequence everybody on the planet. It would, it would, it would result in a net gain. Uh, is, you know, and I, I think there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a growing amount of economic mm -hmm. modeling that, that supports that. Yeah, it sounds like the the Apollo program where people always say like, oh, we spent, put a lot of money into it, but we, the return on investment was like for every $1, we got like 12 or $13 back. Yeah. Like that's a great deal. Just like yeah. you don't notice it in the moment because people are like, what about ism about everything? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So the, even though we haven't gone back to the moon and you could say, well, you know, that was nothing. That was a wash. Uh, you know, 
it was one of the most expensive projects uh, in history, uh, right up there with the Manhattan Project. But we did, even though we didn't go back to the moon, we got GPS satellites, we got mm -hmm. other satellites, and uh, um, uh, you know, a variety of the telecommunications satellites. So those three alone were were, were some of the biggest uh, ticket items uh, in in return on investment. So yeah, yeah, and then um, the the making organisms so that they can't be like virus proof is like how much summarize it um what was the organism i don't think i read about this was it did you uh, get in pigs it, it's uh it's a uh it's a bioarchive preprint that will be a nature paper soon um mm, okay. and accepted um it uh um uh it, the the organism is e coli um, which mm. has a pretty a, a particularly severe virus problem. There, there, there are a huge number of characterized and uncharacterized uh, viruses. In contrast to, to like the second favorite uh, microbe, industrial microbe, I would say is uh, yeast, baker's yeast. Mm -hmm. And baker's yeast has essentially no virus problem. Um, I mean, that's just evolutionarily. So, so E. coli has enormous one, yeast has very little. They're both the top among the top two industrial microbes. But I would say that m most mi industrial microbes fall into the E. coli category. I mean, they have virus problems. So for example, almost everything that's in the air dairy industry, yogurt, cheese, mm -hmm. so forth, all those microorganisms have virus problems. In fact, that's one of the reasons that one of the first applications of CRISPR was in the dairy industry um, because it yeah. had such a big virus problem. It did, still, um, not, still not did, solved, but it was certainly it was a motivation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm still waiting for them to put up uh, a, the past year statue, the giant milk thing that we talked about like five years ago. On because um, you're on, I think like the the road that's near. I hope this isn't doxing, like where you where you work, but like there's like a road nearby called Past Year Street or something. Like the, the pasteurization guy. And I think like five years ago we were talking about like we should get a giant like milk carton to like symbolize like his street and everything. Well, um, yeah, I, 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 my my address at, at Harvard uh, Medical School is Avenue Louis Pasteur, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. we do have a giant milk carton not on Avenue Louis Pasteur, but uh, down in downtown Boston. Uh, it's it's in some tourist section, you know, mm -hmm. where, where they have a, a few museums, the Children's Museum and the Computer Museum. I'm not quite sure what the milk is all about. I think it's a place where you can get ice cream. <laughs> mm. They should move it down to your your, your street, uh, given the, what the business is up to. And, yeah. and a, a giant uh, wine bottle as well while they're at it. Yeah. Mm. And um, for uh, so viruses, how do how do we know that the viruses just like won't see that as a potential food source and adapt to find it? Like how how, how can we be certain that they won't wow. just make new viruses? Right. So um, the the way we did it is we swung. For, for two codons out of the 64 mm -hmm. triplets, um, mm -hmm. we swapped uh, the amino acid from serine to leucine. So normally these two would be serine and now they're leucine. And the, the, the host, the E. coli host was in on the game. And so we, we swapped them around so that the host is completely unaffected. The virus was excluded from this. No, normally there would be coevolution where for every step that the bacteria would mm -hmm. take, the virus would take, this, you know, a comp, a complementary step and would keep up with it. But we took it offline and made, uh, thousands of changes, about 20,000 changes. And now the virus has every time it sees those two codons, which is quite frequently serine, these two serine codons are, are common in every, every protein. That means every protein has a mixture of serine and leucine at every place this occurs. So it means every protein is broken in multiple ways. And so the only way to get them back to where it's at all functional would be to have some kind of uh, way of editing all those sites, this kind of the same way the host was without intelligence um, and not edit all the other ones. So it's dead. And the level mm -hmm. of mutagenesis that you would need to get that level of editing would kill, kill it in other places. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's hard for it to escape. Now there is the possibility of making new viruses. So viruses in a certain sense are as little as a polymerase that it got from the host encapsulated in some way in proteins plus lipids or plus or minus lipids. 
Uh, and so that could happen. Um, but uh, I think it would take a long time. Uh, mm. We've never, I don't think we've ever observed one going from scratch. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if one did arise, then we would, you know, maybe there are things we can do to prevent the polymerases from being co-opted or, um, and we don't, we also don't know how capsids form spontaneously, but probably there's all kinds of ways to aggregate proteins and they just become more and more symmetric, um, as time goes by. Yeah. And then I think, um, like using the software analogy, like if potentially if there was something like that, you could just offer like a, a software update to the biology, like anyone who's using that type of thing. And then it would like, you could always stay out of step. If right. there was a virus, it was like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Oh, did you say something? Nope. Okay, good. I just always like to make sure I'm, I'm listening. Um, when you develop technology like this, uh, I feel like there's got to be like a hundred companies that just kind of like follow you around and just like wait for it to come out and then they buy up the IP. Um, to, to what extent is like, not that like bother you, but in the sense that like um, if everyone's, I think in like the 70s or 80s, like there's like this myth, myth that like uh, there was an electric car and like some oil people built, uh, bought it up so that no one could have electric cars. So um, how, how do you make sure that like no one just buys up the IP and like puts it on a shelf? Granted, like, I guess if you sell it to like Ginkgo Bioworks, like the E. coli stuff would just fit into their program and then they would just love it so much. But um, how do you make sure that like the IP actually goes to good people like that are actually going to use it? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, there are two ways. Uh, one mm -hmm. is that Harvard usually almost always puts a clause in the agreement that says if you don't meet the following milestones, oh, okay. the uh, IP returns to Harvard and they don't return your money. <laughs> so it's actually, it's Harvard's advantage to, mm. to monitor it and make sure that they do meet the milestones. And the milestones are usually crafted to be pretty easy to observe. The second mm. way that, that, that one avoids this is by um, spinning off companies rather than being reactive to companies on the outside buying it. You spin out a company that, that is formed by the postdocs that invented it. And they're highly motivated to see it succeed because it, basically it's their entire life up to that point, their entire professional life has been developing this technology. And if anything, they're biased in favor of it where they, they think it's the greatest thing, where it may or may not be. Um, but a big company, when it buys up stuff, it's because a lot of big companies have lost their ability to innovate. Uh, mm -hmm. They'll even admit this. Uh, I've been inside such big companies uh, as a uh, board of directors and 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 the way they innovate is by buying companies that have already innovated so so basically uh they don't know, they don't see it coming uh when, when mm. harvard says hey we have this ip available they don't see the value of it mm. the way that a postdoc that invented it would and even if they did uh, harvard's going to tend to favor the the the, the young startup because eventually it will get out either on its own or by being acquired by one of these big companies at a later date. Makes sense. And then uh, just uh, when people are transitioning from academia to the startup, like the postdocs, like narrowing in, uh, since you're in so mo so many different projects, are there are there problems? Are, are there things that they need to adjust? Because like the ac academia from the from I haven't worked in academia, but I'm totally it's kind of like it's one mode of success, like how to do something. But then startups like it's entirely different. They have to be faster, like whatever. Um, what what transitions or what what new skills that they have to develop uh, to make that jump successfully so they can build something and without it like you know crashing and burning? Yeah, I think that's a great question, uh, and it hap it it it's um, you know, I think some environments are better for that transition than others. So mm -hmm. so it, in it, over the years we've accumulated a bunch of alumni that have done this successfully, and they mm -hmm. either inspire from a distance or up close. Uh, they will ins inspire the next generation and tell them where the landmines are and where the pots of gold are. And uh, that, that, that all helps. Uh, it helps them know whether they want to go into uh, join a big company, form their own company, or stay in academia or something else. Um, and then, so if they have the prepared mind, that's, that's a, a big part of it. The, the main thing is that academics are... Uh, the job is to spend money and companies mm. job is to make money. And that's a big cultural difference. Uh, you know, also there's, there tends to be a lot more 
uh, deadlines and milestones in companies, which mm-hmm. isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, more productivity, a uh, little more focus on incremental improvements rather than radical um, risk taking. Um, but each of these is, you know, is some people like it one way, some people like it other. Some are, are willing to go through the academic in order to get to the commercial uh, stage. Uh, you know, companies don't typically train graduate students. Uh, and, you know, and, and so you have to kind of pass through this academic phase uh, at some point or another. It's like metamorphosis. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think it works out overall. Uh, now, one thing to be particularly careful about is when the entire company is made up of academics. Uh, in other words, there's often they're fine, you, you know, a, a, a scientist postdoc will find a business person, either mature or you know, just finished business school, and then they'll make a symbiosis and they'll make a company that that's healthy. But sometimes um, th- they'll want to be, they'll want to have their, their buddies be CEO, mm. CSO, CTO, et cetera. And that also works, but it's, uh, it's much more challenging. It's, you know, it's like elephant balancing on a ball. It definitely mm. can be done. <laughs> In fact, yeah, I would I, say most of my companies are of that second type at this point, but it took mm-hmm. a few years to get to the point where we could do that routinely. I have a, a friend who, when he left postdoc, and I don't, uh, people may know him, I don't know, but um, when he left, he tried putting like uh, doctor people, like you know, postdocs, on sales calls. And, and it was like, he was like, why did I do this? I'll just hire salespeople. Because like the, how a scientist thinks about conveying risk is different than like, Oh, how yeah. you convey risk if you're if you're like really trying to understand what people want right. and so that like like he lost a lot of money <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah it's yeah. a it's a it's a different skill set though I, I do think the 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 structure of questioning things is transferable to sales i think the people just need to like think about it a little bit more i think maybe they'll fit they'd figure it out it's good to have communication uh yeah. throughout the organization especially when you're small uh people will wear multiple hats at the at the startup phase they'll be they'll be both uh, human resources and CTO, for example, or something like that. But um, it's tricky. Yeah, it's tricky. The um, some, Sometimes it feels like this is a great time to be alive because there's so much development going on. And we're talking about longevity. And for the most part, a lot of the longevity interventions are for geared for like as early as possible or it's like cholesterol. So it's like, you know, you can do that at any point, but assuming probably as soon as you have a cholesterol problem. I'm thinking of like, okay, o- O'Connor uh, and uh, what he's working on. But um, do, you, do you feel like the your age grouping tends to get ignored in terms of longevity and in, in the sense that like most things aren't like, I think most people are like shooting for like staying in like the thirties ish range, like getting everyone to like, having like, like the mind and body of a 30 year old. So then, and then it takes time to, to like group it out. So do you feel like in your age grouping, and I think I have a, a big idea how old you are. I think you're like, I don't want to say it in case I'm wrong, but um, 68. you don't look as old as 68. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, like 60. the thing is like, you don't, you don't look the age, you know? So it's like, you're still doing great. Like I, if you someone saw, said you were like 45, I'd be like, yeah, okay, I get it. Um, but do you, my, my like, father uh, went, went, went white when he was 19. So uh, hmm. I was a little bit later. So maybe I'm a little younger. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, well, it's, it's also a benefit having the white hair. I think, you know, maybe people like, like hey this guy has a point then they don't realize how old you are you know like sometimes people are like oh you're young you gotta wait your time but uh so uh for developing longevity technology do you see uh like kind of a shift from my point of view it seems like people are more geared towards like the like the 20s to like 40s but i don't and then there's like some for like cholesterol etc from like 40s to 60s on up um but like if i were to like make a bell curve on it i would i would think like the the largest amount is like in the younger grouping so then do you feel like for your age grouping, they're kind of being like left out? And then are you developing technology to like account for your age grouping? I, I don't, I don't, I, di- I didn't think about it that much from that point of view. Uh, oh. I, partly because, I mean, there's, I, I see a lot of drugs being developed for mm. uh, late onset Alzheimer's, for example, which mm. is 70, 80 years old, which is older than me. Uh, you know, I see, um, you know, uh, you know, a lot of heart disease and cancer is still mainly affects people at end of life by almost by definition. Mm. Uh, and end of life is, is moving up there. I mean, we've basically been adding uh, one year of life to every four years that human race is around. 
uh, and we've now doubled the average lifespan uh, over the last 170 years. So, uh, but we need to do faster than that if we're going to save mm. people alive today. It has to be one yeah. year per year, not one year per four years. And that, I think that's happening because we suddenly, we, you know, it's like the exponential is really starting to take off in biotech. Um, and I and I think it's hitting, you know, first it hit reading and writing DNA, which is very molecular and which is not that mm -hmm. far away from like electronics. Uh, but now it's hitting into cell biology, developmental biology, and that's they've got their own exponential, which is similar. Uh, and I think that will uh, impact. And then and finally, the, the biggest thing that makes me not worry about what age group is being favored. This is kind of like uh, I am worried about uh, ethnic gr ancestry groups and uh, mm. gender uh, discrimination in research. But with aging, you've got this big thing, which is aging reversal. Um, mm -hmm. And we're see we've seen plenty of examples of it in uh, animal systems and human cell culture. Um, and it's, it's a real thing. And so that, that changes the discussion as to what age group you're looking at. In fact, uh, my um, ex postdoc and co-founder of rejuvenate bio Noah Davidson's group just published a paper where they applied the, the therapy, a gene therapy, uh, a triple gene therapy, almost all our, Gene therapies for aging are multiples. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, applied that at 124 weeks of mouse uh, age, which to put that in perspective, about half of the cohort had died uh, from mm -hmm. old age by the time they, by the time the other half got the treatment, and it showed a very significant uh, increase in in lifespan. Uh, so, so you know, it's within our power to, to aim for very late in life, uh, treatments. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's kind of two schools of thought is that you, you need to treat early in order to extend life. The other is that maybe pretty late you can reverse things. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm keeping my mind open on those two schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a, a great series. I think it's the Kamala series where for the, the longest time they just would like every like 20 years, they're getting like this they go into like this pod or something and it would rejuvenate their body back to like 20 and then they would age up to 40 and then they go back to, you know, doing yeah. that again. And then um, sometimes I wonder to what extent is that something we're going to be doing? Like we don't cure Alzheimer's, but we can run rejuvenation up to the point where you basically don't have it functionally. Kind of like how like some nuns are right. so active up until the point they die that we don't realize that they had uh, like plaques and stuff going on in their brain. I wonder to, right. this, to some extent, like, it, is that what we're going to do? And then eventually we can cure it, you know, but uh, I wonder about these things. Do you, uh, uh, what is your uh, position on that? Do you think we'll have like rejuvenation and then eventually uh, cures for uh, the illnesses? Or do you think we'll just like uh, jump rejuvenation in the sense that I'm talking about it and have cures for the different illnesses, which is, yeah. Yeah. I, well, again, there's a few schools of thought here that are yeah. not mutually exclusive. One is that, that there's serious uh, damage to DNA, RNA and proteins, and you have to go in there with your pliers and fix them. Uh, the other is that, if you just convince the cell epigenetically, you know, the, you know, like mm -hmm. you change the culture of the cell, uh, it will think it's young and then it'll get its own pliers out and fix itself. Now, there are obviously some things that are hard to fix uh, uh, by oneself. Uh, for example, if you delete both copies of a tumor suppressor gene, there's you've lost that information from that cell. In principle, you could get it from another cell, but that isn't, there's no, that mechanism hasn't been shown to be common. Um, so those, you might have to literally go back and then reinsert the, the mm. gene, maybe put in a few extra copies. Um, and that could be done preventatively or, or reactively. I think that my, I, I fall on the camp where I think that most of it is epigenetic. And if you, if you change the epigenetics, either naturally or unnaturally, you can, you can fix a lot of things. Um, and we're getting better and better at delivery so we can deliver extra copies of tumor suppressors preemptively. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's going to be a mixture of things that, that deal with specific symptoms of aging and things that a, aim at the core mechanism of aging. And hence, once you get the core mechanism, you can, you can reverse it. So I, mm -hmm. I think we're going to see both um, in big time in the next few years. Has there been anything in the last five years, just thinking of it from the bookends of like first interview and now that has surprised you that has come out? I think the first time we spoke there, CRISPR in terms of therapy was 
um, but they're still developing it. And I think this year they came out with the first two CRISPR therapies, I believe, like that people are actually going to be using them. So I think that's been a change, but I think that's like an expected change. Has anything like surprised you in the last five years? Either longevity yeah, or any was, of the other areas we're talking about? Definitely not surprising. In fact, yeah, about, anything about CRISPR is not particularly surprising other than people's mm. reaction to it. That was surprising to me <laughs> um, because we had really great editing uh, prior to CRISPR uh, for which uh, Mario Capecci and Oliver Smithies got the Nobel Prize for pre, you know, uh, eight 1980s work. Uh, it just wasn't that efficient. So, you know, uh, normally, I don't think making things a little bit more efficient is such a big deal. If you make it 20 million times more efficient, like sequencing, that's a big deal. But CRISPR was maybe four times more efficient or something like that. Um, what has been really surprising? Uh, well, you know, I was really pleasantly surprised by how easy it was to edit repetitive elements. Uh, hmm. So, you know, with all the edit, all the best editing methods, uh, it was very hard to get above say 70% editing. So, you know, 70% of the cells would have one edit, right? And so if you think, well, to get two edits, uh, you know, the, the, the you're gonna have to, the square and the three edits, it's the cube. And pretty soon, you know, none of your cells have all the edits that you want, right? And so the idea of making uh, dozens of edits was was uh, seemed unlikely, uh, to, but nevertheless, um, uh, we we did we had to do it for the pigs uh, organ transplants. We had to get rid of the viruses that they produce. All pig organs produce uh, retroviruses, and retroviruses. We were a little uh, the the world was a little gun shy about retroviruses because that's what screwed up gene therapy. Uh, around the year 2000 is that the retroviral therapy caused uh, cancer via the LMO2 oncogene. And so we, <clears throat> the FDA did not want to have a bunch of pig retroviruses infecting human uh, cells in immune compromised patients. Anyway, we, we did that in our first experiment, we got 62 at once, 62 edits, each of which individually seemed like it was, you know, 50 to 80% probability. So it just seemed astronomically unlikely that you know, it's like that you would uh you know pull up uh, the ace of spades 62 times in a row uh and uh and then since then we've extended it we've now done 25,000 edits uh and that that I, I never <laughs> cease to be amazed at how easy it is actually to to uh, make that number of edits and i think we're going to see more and more uses of multiplex editing just like we have more and more uses of multiplex therapies or polypharmacy is sometimes called. Um, so for, in, you know, for engineering, agricultural species, industrial species, and even human uh, cells for uh, cell therapies. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I think I was watching a, an interview with you. We were talking about how like you're working or like there's a, uh, theoretically we could get to like a million cell edits at the same time with multiplexing. And that's, um, I, I guess like the timeline from like 20 to 20,000 is pretty, was, it seems pretty fast. So then 20,000 to a million doesn't seem like it'd be that far off. I think we may already have the protocol. We just haven't, uh, uh, you know, applied it uh, yet. Mm -hmm. We have definite applications for it and we're moving in yeah. that direction. I mean, for example, the virus resistance that we have in E. coli only took uh, 20,000 edits. The, the virus resistance in um, mammalian, the equivalent virus resistance in mammalian cells would probably be hundreds of thousands of edits, uh, maybe a million. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's 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 one driver. Um, uh, um, de extinction of genes, mm -hmm. not necessarily species, or maybe even species. Could involve millions of edits. I think we're going to get away with hundreds, but but since this is moving so quickly, I wouldn't be totally surprised if we get to millions by the time we need it. Is there um is there I don't, I don't know. I've been playing Kerbal Space Program. It's a game on like uh, space flight, so everything's in like space terms for me, which is bad. But uh, an apogee is like the top point before you start going down. Is there yeah. is there an apogee where like uh, if you did more like I just 
where you have like re reduced returns for how many more edits you can do. So like if you had like, you know, 10 million, the ability to affect 10 million cells at the same time um, versus like 1 million is like getting the, the extra difference in 10 million doesn't actually do much more. Like you reach like a cap where like you're not doing that much more, yeah. if that makes sense. So like, um, is there a cap where like editing more cells at once would actually not be useful or is it uh, more I, generally as useful? I just want to point out there's, there's two kinds of multiplexing here that you okay. nicely pointed out uh, that I had glossed over. There's one is the number of edits per cell. <clears throat> And that's the thing that I was talking about. We're, we're at 25,000. We're heading towards a million. Um, and then there's a number of cells edited at once. And you could have both, mm. which is a large number of cells edited, a large number of positions each. Um, so um, um, so as early as 2009, we made billions of cells that each had a, a small collection of edits. So it, was, mm. it wasn't one edit per cell. It might be five or 10 per cell, but billions of cells. So we had a very large diversity of, of genomes that were designed, not, not random, not entirely random. Um, you know, I think that uh, points of note of diminishing returns, certainly for, for the, let's say, codon remapping, there's a certain number of edits you have to make before you can delete the, the transfer RNA or, or swap mm -hmm. the, the serine and leucine that I mentioned to get, get you virus resistance. And if you stop before that, you're going to have a, you know, a key protein that's got a mixture of serines and leucines, just like the virus. And so the cell is going to die. So, um, so that's a threshold thing mm -hmm. um, for the extinction. Let's say there may be as few as a hundred that, that allow the elephant to be cold resistant and to do its thing on restoring the, the uh, Arctic, you know, the vibrant Arctic ecosystem as a keystone species, maybe as few as 100, um, but it might take millions to make it genetically identical to its an to its uh, common ancestor or uh, something like that. Um, and that would be a point of diminishing returns where the ecosystem impact, you got most of it in the first 100, uh, and the only reason you keep going is because you can. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Makes sense. Yeah, and then um, I definitely see the <clears throat> an application for the. I'm going to call it the you know the, the make it so like uh, viruses can't impact uh, animals like uh, testing out on agriculture so that you know you don't have those problems wherever because like for the most part, oh, viruses come from animals like when they hop over to humans and then that's what kills humans because it's not built Absolutely. for our body. Yeah. Which uh, uh, anyone familiar with the show will know that I comment on like how when when uh, when the Europeans came to America we brought horrible stuff here. But there was not really a transmission from Americas back to Europe because uh, the Americas didn't really have that many domesticated animals. I think they only had alpacas that they really domesticated. So there wasn't that many, like Europe had like pigs, chickens, you know, they had so many different things. So there's just ma many more opportunities for it. So making agriculture uh, something where uh, that jump doesn't happen, then we, we don't potentially won't have like, you know, COVID and stuff that happens to us. Um, there was, you talked in one of your uh, uh, recent interviews uh, about software as biology. And um, you you made a comment, and like, I was like, oh, I wonder what he means by this, because like I, you weren't able to expound on it. So I thought I'd just ask you now. You stated that uh, using that as an analogy, you say that there is a lot of biology and analog circuits that people are overlooking. And whenever you say, hey, someone's overlooking, someone's like, oh wow, I definitely want to learn more. What what do you what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, there's two opportunities. One is making uh, put making cells more digital, and the other is um, using what is the strength of, of uh, cellular computing, which is more analog. Mm. Okay. And, and and examples of analog is, uh, you know, uh, measuring uh, the temperature. Uh, and you can turn that into you, analog to digital and digital to analog are very common in electronics. And the same thing happens in biology is you can you can say you build up a certain amount and then you decide where it is in the day and you set your circuity and clock or you get a certain temperature and you decide that it's spring and it's time to do the whole vernal uh, cycle thing, uh, et cetera. So, uh, but then there are other things where there isn't a switch that's flipped. You stay analog where, um, you know, the, the temperature increases a little bit, then you, uh, you, then you uh, stop shivering and you, and, you, and you get rid of your uh, th thermogenesis, brown fat stuff um, and vice versa. So, um, 
there's no, I don't know, hard and fast rule where it, something has mm-hmm. to be digital, has to be uh, analog, but there definitely are cases where it's a little more efficient from an engineering standpoint or an evolutionary standpoint. Uh, one one thing that I'm uh, uh, keen on getting the digital going back in is recording information into the DNA of, of cells. We've, we've uh, set a record of recording two terabytes of information into uh, the DNA of um, mice um, about you can record physiological and developmental data. And we think we can scale that up to 20 petabytes um, by uh, hiding the information in, in the parts of repetitive elements that, that we will find imp- empirically are not uh, disruptive. Uh, and so the reason I describe it in petabytes rather than analog terms is because DNA is is essentially digital and you know it's got mm. it's got two bits per per base pair um but m- a huge fraction of biology the, the thing about biology it does this very natural gradation between analog and digital so for example uh a group in uc irvine has used m- our method to encode uh, hypoxia data in, in from analog state into this digital digital dna state so mm. Um, and we need to be able to go the other direction too. So we need to be able to take the digital DNA data and turn it into analog physiological um, um, responses. Yeah, I think uh, it, it, what uses, uh, well, one I think of uh, is like, you know, sometimes we want to put like uh, bio banks or something on the moon or, you know, in different spots. But if we could just like record all the data and like hide it in cells or like a really like, Power, like you know like the people make co- uh, comments like if there's a nuclear war like cockroaches would rule the world so we could like hide that stuff and like uh, cockroaches for us to pull out in the future but uh that's like more like you know apocalypse type stuff what yeah. what uses are, is there to trans you know have like 20 uh, petabytes of data stored in, in cells right okay so um i mean there's a a, a fork here in the road where mm. you're storing uh data that is definitely digital let, let, let's say uh you know Table, you know, <clears throat> tables of where all the cities are and things like that. Uh, that's digital information. It's very cultural. Um, the other is where you're storing data that is biological, that was essentially biological analog and digital data. You're storing it in a new form that's more compact. Uh, and so you're essentially creating a time record, kind of a, a, a tape recording or a, a flight recorder uh, is I think the best analogy where uh, um, in case something goes wrong, you can go and inspect the record in whatever cell you want. So if something went wrong in the liver, you can go into the liver and itself and see what its flight recorder is, says. Mm-hmm. So uh, so I think this could be used medically or potentially environmentally to, to, if something bad happens, you go in and you can go to a particular coordinate where the bad thing happened and uh and lift out some some dna and figure out what happened you don't have to sequence the entire ecosystem or the entire organism to figure it out um so it's just like a flight recorder i think is is Mm -hmm. the is the main use case that i have so far but you know it's one of these things a little baby you don't know where it's going to go next so yeah that would be interesting if it was like uh, if you had it in every organism on the planet so whenever you were exposed to it, you kind of like re- you could see like what was happening to it for the course of its life. It's kind of yeah. like uh, tagging sharks. You could just you know take a little biopsy and then you'd you'd have yeah. all the information. Then yeah, it'd be really cool. Exactly. Um, yeah. The one thing that you in one of one of your other talks that I wanted to touch on before I think we jumped in more longevity related things um, is uh, you talked about using synthetic biology as manufacturing. Well, we talked about this in our first one. Um, yeah. I don't know if anything has developed any faster on this. But you talked about it as a way to alleviate uh, poverty. You know, if we came in and we could build, uh, manufacture through synthetic biology medicines, then that's one last thing that the the uh, the society that is in poverty has to worry about. So they can invest in other things. But I was I was reading that uh, in like Poland, for instance, they use clams to determine if uh, if uh, uh, water treatment plants have filtered enough of the water for it to be drinkable. They use like you know a biology process. So I was, uh, I was really taken by this idea of using biomanufacturing to alleviate poverty. If you could go in and then build uh, you know water treatment like a uh, self replicating and uh, rejuvenating system for like water sanitation and all these other things could win. Poverty one of the biggest things is like they don't really have clean water. You know medicine's a huge one of course. So if you could alleviate all those things then 
uh, make it something that they just have to like you know feed i guess that may be really cool i, I just like really taken by that idea of can we use synthetic biology to alleviate poverty and lift people up and build systems because like even in america we have like flint michigan that's like i think it still has lead in the uh the waters and we have um like chemical spills and all these other things so like having like a biological process that could break it down um and then um or manufacture to create something uh because biology does seem extremely efficient compared to like what humans can do like i don't think we're as efficient as what biology can do yet yeah so oh you you you're touching a nerve here uh in a good way uh in that i think that not only can we uh create a virtuous circle for um poverty where you alleviate a little bit and that gives them a little bit more health and uh, education to, to, to make the next increment in, in lifting up out of poverty, lifting themselves out of poverty. In, in particular, I think that one can, that one can imagine, and we're working on uh, a, 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 a box essentially where, uh, where it, it produces food and then and you do complete recycling. So you can think of the house, you can have a house that's like a space station or a submarine mm -hmm. completely sealed in nothing exchanged with the outside world other than, you know, energy from geothermal or solar or wind, whatever, um, that that then uh, s helps recycling. Uh, and because you're in complete control, each household it, it has its own system. Once you have a clean system that doesn't have lead in it, doesn't have other industrial pollutants in it, um, uh, it will stay clean. Um, and also you, you will have known mechanisms for cleaning it up in the first place. So, you know, there are no mechanisms by which you can biologically decompose uh, dioxin and other toxins uh, where you can um, take uh, heavy metals and sequester them into a lump in the, in the mm -hmm. side and you just leave it there. Um, but then from then on, the, the, it's internal. You eliminate supply chain uh, costs and, and insecurity. So a lot of the problem with poverty is, is not so much they're impoverished today. It's that the next time there's a supply chain issue, uh, you know, they, ha they have to pick up and, and go and they become refugees and all kinds of things like that. So you need to have a more stable supply chain. And what could be better than having it, you know, all within your house? Um, also, a huge amount of the, the uh, environmental damage is done due to, you know, making pipelines and roads and and uh, manufacturing of, of uh, trucks and so forth. And that could be eliminated if, if you know, 90% of the manufacturing occurs in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I, even the, like some of the basic stuff that people do for like biohacking, uh, or just like when they're first learning genetic engineering, it's like, hey, can we add something and then have like it like be um, bioluminescent at the same time? So um, if there's like something going wrong in the system, like it could be as simple as like, you know, you know, color coding it so the you're reducing the level of technical expertise that a person using the system would even need to have to it's kind of like the chinese box like they would just need to know like these co the, the, these colors correspond with these things that inputs they have to put into it they just go on with their day it's even better than that uh and you can make it so they just ask what they want so they say i want you know a vegan burger right and you press mm -hmm. vegan burger and out comes one and so that there's no colors to match or anything. You just you just see what you like, and or it even remembers what you like you know, to have on Fridays. Um, and it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like GPS, you know, on your phone. Uh, you have most people have no idea of how many satellites there are and what angle they have to be at, and and uh, yeah. how they're synced up with 37 atomic clocks uh, and all this stuff that is required for it to tell you to turn left. Um, and that's uh, that's the beauty of it is you don't you don't even need to have simple programming skills. You just need you talk to it the way you would talk to a, a, a extremely knowledgeable person. So I, I I think that same thing will be true for manufacturing. It's it's not that hard to recycle, um, you know, complete do complete recycling. Uh, we have plant and animal systems that have been going for you know eight decades uh, in a completely sealed container. Uh, it doesn't have to be completely sealed with humans, but it would be, if you can do that, then you have a whole new set of capabilities. Even submarines and the International Space Station, um, you know, rarely go the, more than a few months. Uh, they're always getting resupplied. So it's not really 
a sealed system, uh, except for the short periods of times that are in between supply runs. Uh, but we can definitely do it. We know how to do it for animals. So. Mm-hmm. And, and it yeah. would also reduce certain existential risks. So, uh, you know, uh, certain kinds, of, depending on your sources of energy, certain kinds of, you know, asteroids, uh, pandemics, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, super volcanoes and so forth. Uh, you could, you could, and, and you could also prepare for, for leaving the planet. If you, you test out the whole, um, survival in small clans uh, or small um, uh, isolated systems. You test it out on Earth, where the risk is lower. Uh, if you, if something goes wrong on Mars, you got a couple of years to get back to the nearest emergency room. While on Earth, you, you test out these modules um, right right in the shadow of a city. Mm-hmm. There was a. I was watching this. Uh... This, it was a smarter every day. He's a great YouTuber. He like goes and discovers things. He went on a submarine and he looked at like how they produce food, and they had like this like a like a like a corridor stocked with food. And but to get to something, they have to take it all out to get in there to find like you know ketchup or you know maple syrup. And they've organized as best as they can, yeah. but there's not that much space in a submarine. So instead of needing like uh, so many different food stocks, you could just have like uh, several food stocks and then use this uh, biomanufacturing process to then create the food from there. Exactly. So I think that like even like it'd be space efficient uh, and you, know, you don't have to do like play uh, Tetris with it too much, uh, right. which would be pretty, exactly. pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, it's doing the Tetris because it's probably yeah. all the all the different producing mic- industrial microbes are inside the box and you just say, make this and then somebody else has programmed it. It, it adds a whole new level to the idea of recipes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, where the input is something much closer to, uh, to, uh, to, to raw synthetic biology. Yeah, um, I think the closest to this type of system that I can think of is like, you know, cellular agriculture in terms of, you know, taking cells and just producing yeah. it based on what you're giving it. Um, yep. Is there anything that you can think of that's working towards this type of system? Um, well, that's the disappointing thing is there aren't, I mean, there, there are some, mm-hmm. uh, algae that are fairly, uh, nutritious and tasty like spirulina, uh, that also, uh, but, but the, no one has, there's almost no recipes for making things entirely out of, uh, such organisms. Um, mm-hmm. usually they use them as garnish or, or, uh, you know, a little bit of seasoning just to feel good about it. But, uh having recipes entirely based, but it, it's not that far away either. I mean, making recipes is something that everybody can do. It's like, it's one of the few citizen sciences that literally everybody participates in in one way or another. Um, so I, I think this would just be in, incredibly enabling uh, to, to be able to, it, it could keep track of the nutrition for you. You just you just tell it what you like to, to taste mm-hmm. and, and you experiment with, with new, um, you know, sources of, uh, metabolism. Could, um, so the, the interesting thing with like energy generation, for instance, is it's all basically just built on a turbine, you know, like even like nuclear power plants, I thought that'd be cooler. You know, like people were like, oh, they're going to like, you know, kill people or whatever. And I actually looked into how they're, you know, how they work. And it's no different than just like, you know, spinning a, a turbine, like just like steam is generated, whether it's like coal or whatever. And, um, a, a turbine is turned, uh, uh, turned and then like that's power that comes out. Could we ever like, Obviously, you, you shouldn't do this because it doesn't make sense. But like, if we like took mitochondria and like blew it up, and uh, I, I guess that's a horrible uh, analogy. But can we use a biomanufactured uh, energy plant to produce energy as efficiently? I think uh, I think um, nuclear is the most efficient form of energy. So can we do the same thing with like with power using uh, biomanufactured like a, like a cell thing, with Bob? That's a technical uh, term. Probably, yeah. Well, take photovoltaic as an easy example. Mm-hmm. I'll get back to nuclear. Um, photons come in, they get electronically converted to uh, you know, uh, a voltage, and, and then that can, uh, pro- can uh, go straight into biological systems. So you can have either electro uh, metabolism or it can turn back into photons that are at the right wavelength. So photons coming in are include infrared, green, and ultraviolet, none of which are well-tuned to a lot of photosynthetic systems. Anyway, so you can essentially remap without turbines 
Um, and then, and then the, then the biology has all kinds of chemistry, basically almost all chemistry probably could be done that we're interested in could be done biologically. Um, nuclear would be, uh, I think more challenging, uh, but there are, um, there, there are thermonuclear devices in, uh, certain space, um, probes that, uh, this is past tense, this is not in the future, um, that do not involve turbines as far as I know. And so mm. they're not, they're not at the very high level of, uh, of, a, of a modern fission reactor. And we don't even know what the fusion reactors are going to be like, but probably they're, they're so hot that it's going to be very tempting to, to run turbines. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't think it really matters if you have a centralized facility, it does turbines are fine. It's just when you mm -hmm. want to be off the grid, then you might want geothermal or solar. Probably probably something geothermal might be the safest one, maybe wind, because if you get like a nuclear winter or something like that due to a super volcano or a, a meteor hitting, um, then you want to have something that's that's a little bit safer than photovoltaics from the, from that kind of standpoint. Mm -hmm. Oh, recently so, reading about thermal is is effective yeah. almost anywhere on the planet. Uh, yeah. it's, it's easiest to do when it's near the surface, like in Iceland, but uh, but everywhere on the planet has you know six hundred degrees centigrade if you drill deep enough. Uh, so uh, you know it takes some investment to get down there and. Uh, but then from that point off, you're off the grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was recently reading how fit, uh, efficient uh, geothermal is in terms of like um, how easy it is to, to hook up because you can actually get them in like for houses and stuff and they'll last for like 50 to 100 years like the piping that you put under yep. underground and it's like it's not even that deep. I, I was saying like you have to like really be in a special spot. Maybe it's from sci-fi because it's always like in a volcano we're doing like geothermal or something. But um, I... I a lot of the a lot of the systems we're talking about it reminds me of like this science fiction where there's like subgenres like uh like frost punk or uh like but but basically there's like biopunk where like everything's built out of biological uh, systems and it, and it feels like there there could be a future and not too distant future where um you know um like a lot of the things in society are built using biology versus uh you know like people's hands you know like in terms of like us having to build it uh which would be pretty interesting and if you do want to uh, do stuff like that you should build it in the, the midwest because it's much cheaper i tell everyone this all the time if you look at the how 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 expensive things are on like the coast to the midwest it's so much more affordable out here um though it's it's really cool that this can be built where it is and they make use of all the other networks around it in terms of uh innovation and stuff like that um there there was a a, a fan question about uh the woolly mammoth and i just want to pull it up real quick because uh it's, it's a really cool thing i think when we first were talking about it it was just like a, a, not like a twinkle in your eye like you were working on it i think you had like a <laughs> there was a book where the guy i think it's called uh woolly or mammoth where the, there was like he talked about how like there was a mouse and it like roared like a lion like uh, not a lion like the woolly mammoth because like you put some cells into it uh which i think is just like a really great imagery even if it wasn't true um in regards to the woolly ma the mammoth re restoration project uh, can you talk about the modifications that you're going to be making to the Asian elephant other than giving it fur? I looked online and I tried to see if I could like, you know, reverse engineer what was actually being done. Um, but is it possible to talk about what type of uh, work you're doing on the Asian elephants to move it to the woolly mammoth in terms of like in specificity? Uh, or sure, like secret? Absolutely. It, it's uh, uh, we're, we're, ha we're going to have a paper or two coming out uh, uh, pretty soon uh, where we lay this out. Uh, Maybe within the, within the next uh, eight months or so, uh, the, and, and we've we, we've discussed some of this, uh, but the the list is mainly focused on uh, cold adaptation, mm -hmm. uh, or you could say handling both winter and summer, where the winter is minus forty and the summer is normal. <laughs> um, and el Asian elephants actually can tolerate pretty low temperature and in enjoy playing in the snow and, and even playing in frozen lakes. They'll break through the ice and they'll swim around for a while, but they can't do it for very long or for very cold or very low, high wind chill. Um, and so, so, so one needs uh, fat deposits. So there was like 10 centimeters of fat pretty much all over the body of the mammoths that was not in um, modern elephants. Uh, instead of the, the short, uh, spiky 
uh, sparse hairs that are essentially radiative. They radiate heat. Um, instead, they had the thick, the mammoths had the thick woolly hair. Um, so those two probably aren't that hard. Um, there are more physiological, more biochemical things like their hemoglobin was adapted to uh, to release oxygen at lower temperatures than is normal. So, so the, the skin temperature um, uh, is getting close to freezing point, um, even though the core body temperature is the same as our core body, the skin is different. So that, that, uh, that, that, that's one of the genes that has been uh, uh, restored, de-extincted and, and shown to be uh, have plausible functionality. Uh, the ears have to be smaller so they don't mm. get frostbite, uh, you know, uh, a few things like that. There, there's some things that may not be present in the mammoth that we're also, it's also on our list. Uh, that are present in neither the modern elephants nor the ancient ones. And those are things like resistance to killer pathogens. Uh, in fact, ele- back to the whole virus thing that we talked about earlier, uh, elephants have a very serious virus problem. Uh, they're partly they're endangered species because of herpes viruses, and um, and so we have various strategies we're exploring to make them resistant to either all viruses or to the specific EEHV virus, which is uh, part of what's making them go extinct. Um, and then, then we may have um, adaptations to um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, poach, poaching, you know, where they, they either have, you know, very short or no tusks under certain circumstances mm-hmm. and in other circumstances where they're well cared for and guarded, they'll have the big, you know, maybe even bigger tusks than, than, uh, than usual. So, so those two things, uh, you know, the virus resistance and the tusk manipulation may not depend on the mammoths. But, but most of them are inspired. We, the other place where we could deviate a little bit from the mammoth inspiration, we could look at polar bears and penguins and other um, uh, cold-tolerant animals for, for ideas uh, and maybe make these elephants even more cold-tolerant than the mammoths were. Um, but the, you know, this is, the point is we're not limited. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and that's, that's, that's the short list uh, that you were looking for, I think. Yeah. Is it... Uh... For controlling the tusk length, would it just be like uh, if you gave them like a, a certain food size? I think of um, like a, a bees, like the difference between a queen bee and a regular yes. bee is like they're just fed something differently. Would that be like how you'd regulate it uh, in terms of like being in a safe spot versus not safe spot? Exactly. We, we yeah. already have uh, projects where we've uh, made organisms that are biocontained, meaning that if they don't get this chemical, which is not available in the wild, it's only made by organic chemists. Then, then they can't replicate. And uh, in the case of the elephants, it might be that same chemical, which uh, they can't make tusks without that chemical. Um, and so you, you put that in the feed uh, in a very well protected animal reserve. You know, it might be, um, you know, hundreds of square kilometers, but it's very well guarded. Uh, but then when you let them out into the millions of square kilometers of the uh, Canadian and and Alaska and, and Russian Arctic, there their their tusks will be small, and that's already been de- it's already been shown. There are there are tribes of elephants that that don't have tusks and they do fine. Uh, there are tribes of mm-hmm. elephants that have ridiculously long tusks, uh, and and the, and the genetics of this has been studied, and we'll we'll exploit it. Is there uh, any plans to expedite the gestation period? Because I think elephants have like twenty two months, which is a pretty long time. Yeah. Uh, we are definitely interested in short gestation periods. It'll probably uh, result in smaller animals, uh, mm. although there are animals that keep growing, you know, for, for in other words, they, they're born small, but they keep growing until they're quite large. Um, I mean, for example, the, the record for short gestation are, is in marsupials and in rodents, um, non-marsupial uh, eutherian mammals. It's, it's around 20 days for a mouse and maybe 13 for the fastest marsupial. But the marsupials are essentially born. They're still, they look like fetuses. I mean, they, they can crawl up and get to the milk, but they, uh, 
And, and the same thing's true for the rodents. When the rodents are born, they're they're blind, they're hairless, they, they, they're very, very fragile. Uh, they're not like, um, you know, like uh, uh, cattle. <laughs> they come out mm-hmm. running, you know. Uh, yeah. So, so there's a trade-off, but, but, but it would be helpful to get feedback quickly by having a short gestation. And I, I don't think we're going to make a 20 day gestation period rather than 22 uh, months. Um, but we might, I mean, there might be some reason to do that. Uh, um, yeah. And the other, but more important maybe than gestation length is how many we can do in parallel. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think if we can do this ex vivo, which, which we've got a fair amount of, uh, effort on that uh then we can uh, have them you know essentially in this giant warehouse or conveyor belt or something where they're um where we could have ten thousand of them growing without uh interfering with the reproduction of the endangered the current uh, endangered species we're close to being able to replicate gestation outside of the womb I thought we were like we only had we only had like artificially could like test drugs on like a like it's like a little chip. I didn't know we could we were close to having something where you could like really take it out of the system out of the the mom. Well, it's it's hard to say how close they are, but but there are parts that make it seem like we might be close if you're mm-hmm. in, you know embedded in the field. So for example, you can take mice up to almost. Uh, nine, 10 days, which is halfway through gestation from, from fertilization and human preemies, we can get half, we can take them. So they're only halfway through a normal, uh, uh, human gestation and take them all the way to birth and they're, and they're fine. So that, so in a way you can get halfway from both sides. So it seems like all you have to do is bridge it. The problem is that most of the protocols for getting, uh, halfway from fertilization, um, you you haven't really hooked it up to uh, umbilical cords and, and placenta properly. So it's, so you can't just trivially s- swap into preemie mode. Um, and there's just a little gap there. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, another, we are getting um, just much better at... Um, producing organs for transplant. I mentioned the pig organs is one of them. Um, and this, and, and keeping transplantable organs alive outside the body. So if you can keep the endometrium, the uterine wall alive, like you would an organ outside of the body, then implantation is mm. almost automatic. Um, and then, then the two halves, the embryo half and the maternal half, have well evolved mechanisms for all the feedback physiology and so forth. So the, the key thing is getting in the metrium to be able to, um, be healthy outside the body. Um, uh, the, 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 you know, the development, um, is, is, fa- is fairly much on autopilot, but no one, it, it's, a, it's amazing how little effort has gone into maintaining organs outside the body, mainly because most transplants don't need to be outside the body more than a few hours. So there's not a heavy up until now. There hasn't been a heavy motivation for for setting records on that. But that's that's what we're doing. Hmm. Yeah, uh, with organ transplant, I've always felt like like the the time horizon, like they have to move really fast. But there's are there's also a lot that just like there's no one around to use them, so no one gets to use them. So having like a like a bio bank of organs that can just be maintained until they're used. But then again, um, you know, then just like manufacture our own organs is also pretty cool. Um, so. I, I'm I'm generally curious if, if when you're developing a product, sometimes you just like find people and you see what their pain points are, and then people can like kind of help in building things around that. I'm curious for you and your innovation. Are there problems that you have that if someone's like, "Hey, I come in with," I mean, I guess this like uh, the uh, ex vivo process to generate uh, elephants would probably be a process you would love help with. But are there tools or techniques that you wish were being uh, that that you wish you had to do the work that you're doing to like expedite them? Oh, absolutely. Uh, most of the tools I wish I had, I'm working on, uh, but mm. still they, some of them seem to take a while. Uh, I would, uh, let's, I mean, I, I, 
you know, wish we had uh, better microscopy uh, that were, I mean, right now we finally have microscopy that can work at pretty high resolutions, like 20 nanometers, maybe better, uh, where we can label the NARNA and protein. So that's, that's a way of, when we're engineering, you want to be able to check to see what you're doing, right? And so a lot of what we're doing is invisible um, with the naked eye. And so we need better, better and better microscopes. Um, and the problem is that once you get to super resolution, if you want to do both uh, large scale and small scale at the same time, uh, you end up with a lot of data. So, so you know, petabytes uh, just to do ordinary things. Um, and then another thing that doesn't scale well, and so a lot of this is scaling, is, uh, is, is uh, say, 3D printing. There's a lot of things. We would like to be able to 3D print anything. I actually teach a course called How to Grow Almost Anything, which is it's on the internet, it's international, and it's a sibling course of how to make almost anything. And we would like to be able to merge those so that we can make any device uh, that is currently inorganic with biology um, and then and then use the two together to, you know, we should be able to make that. And biology is fairly good at inorganic materials as well, but it's not really there yet. So I'd like to have, um, and, and to use developmental biology rather than uh, Cartesian 3D coordinate printing, which is very slow and doesn't scale well. Uh, biology mm -hmm. has trillions of printhead equivalents per cubic millimeter in the form of ribosomes and cell division and so forth, all these um, molecular machines. So it has this incredibly high density of simultaneously performing printheads while most 3D printers are, you know, kind of this mm -hmm. simple, uh, you know, Cartesian robot. So that's, that's, that's a partial list, uh, mm. um, but the list goes on and on of things that are missing, um, but they're getting filled exponentially. So I'm not panicked, but uh, it, it, they don't, it doesn't fill itself by itself yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So it requires a great deal of ingenuity and hard work to uh, fill those gaps in technology, which is kind of the main thing my group does. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, it's always great to read what you're up to. I, I wonder if you had like a, like a, things we're not covering and we don't know anyone who's covering, like if you had like a list and then people go, oh, okay, you know, they could like use that to generate some ideas. But uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll link the courses to, in the show notes. Um, so uh, uh, fan question, um, gene therapies that have been approved for rare diseases are very expensive. What should we expect in terms of cost? Of, I don't think you'd be able to answer this, but cost oh, for yeah. gene therapies tar answer. targeting... <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, it's for a rejuvenate bio, which I think is what should we expect in terms of cost for gene therapies targeting the biology of aging, like those developed by rejuvenate bio? Because I think like you, you, you can it's, guess even at this point. This is pretty this early. Is I think. A, this is a great question. Is this is this a fan mm -hmm. question? Did you say? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's a great question. Um, and I'm ready for it. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I have uh, pointed out that I'll, um, uh, there may be a, a different strategy for rare diseases and common diseases. And I would put mm. aging in a common disease category. Another common disease is pandemics or, or you know, very large uh, um, vaccination programs. Even if they're currently rare diseases, we still have to vaccinate the entire population. And what happens is for these common diseases, infectious and, and age-related, is since everybody is, is a consumer, uh, the denominator for, you know, you have kind of fixed costs for R&D and clinical mm. trials, and the denominator is the number of people that benefit. So for rare diseases, that denominator is tiny. It could be 100 people a year. Uh, and so the cost is, you know, the, the highest cost I've seen so far for a therapy is $3.5 million per dose for one of the recent rare disease uh, gene therapies. And, and in fact, that, that, that caused me some concern when I entered the field of gene therapy, you know, many years ago is... I, you know, I've, I've been the proponent of making technology equitably distributed uh, so that uh, even poor nations and communities would have access. Uh, and, and, I, and I realized, you know, and we did that. We brought down the cost of reading and writing DNA by, uh, you know, 20 million fold and improved quality at the same time. But for pharmaceuticals, they seem to be creeping up rather than going down exponentially. Um, but then... If you if you reanalyze sort of to uh, uh, think about it a different way, the recent COVID vaccines, the top five of them, were all formulated as gene therapies. 
And um, one of one category of those five is uh, adenoviral capsid around double-stranded DNA encoding uh, the vaccine protein. Um, and that got down to as little as uh, $2.18 per dose. So down from 3.5 million for a rare disease to two point. And they're both you know, viral capsids around double-stranded DNA, their, their gene therapies. Um, so I think that's where it could go. I think that's going to apply to aging reversal and, age, and aging reversal or age, if, if, if you don't like aging reversal, then aging disease, you know, core treatments for hitting multiple aging related diseases, which is what we're doing. Um, that could be in that range. Now, I'm not making a promise from on the behalf of my companies that they're going to sell things for $2 a dose, at, at least initially. But it's certainly, we've got the proof of principle that works. It's been tested, you know, the, the, these gene therapy-like things have been tested in billions of people worldwide. Um, and I think the, the experience has been fairly positive. So I think we're off and running now um, on, on, on common gene therapy. So, that, so now what about the rare ones? Uh, I think one uh, solution that is, that is getting better and better every day and was, was already pretty good uh, is uh, genetic counseling. And this can be done either preconception or premaritally, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the best time because the, there's no risk of false positives causing damage on their own. Um, and it can be done as late as uh, in vitro fertilization or even uh, um, um, prenatal. Um, the in vitro fertilization is getting much better. One of my companies, Orchid, is sequencing every single embryo that goes through the, the uh, IVF clinic. And that helps not only avoid these very serious uh, but rare diseases, get them, you get them all at once because you get the whole genome, but it also helps uh, with, with the fertility itself because a lot of failures in the IVF clinic. So on average, you have to do five rounds of hormone treatment and IVF to get one child. Um, mm -hmm. and a lot of those are due to, um, aneuploids or, or other genetic diseases that are so fatal, they kill the child before it can even be born. And so if you're anti-abortion, you should be anti-spontaneous abortion as well. And this is, a uh, a way by sequencing the, the, uh, IVF, uh, embryos, you can see which ones are, are, are going to survive. And we might get that down to five it's down from five IVFs per baby to one IVF per baby. Um, so I think, I, I think all of that is going, is going to handle the, the rare ones. Uh, now, IVF isn't quite as equitably distributed as uh, the genome sequencing, which will be basically free. And uh, once you get the return on investment work, worked out um, and, um, and aging reversal drugs, which might be once in a lifetime and, $2 a dose. So, and that also could be free because it would be to the government's advantage to have people, you know, working past retirement age, being healthy, not, not consuming. So I think those are the different answers for rare and, and common, but they both hopefully will end up with, you know, equitable uh, distribution to even in, even the poorer communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, some that I thought of um, when you're saying that remind me of the like making it so the viruses can affect things because um, you, you were talking about like uh, you mentioned COVID and the mRNA vaccines. Could, uh, could I didn't we mention use... mRNA vaccines. I actually mentioned uh, adenoviral capsid, uh, double strand mm -hmm. DNA, but but mRNA vaccines are also formulated as gene therapy. It's just a, a less common one and a new one. Mm. I was I was wondering um, just as a quick aside, is it possible to? Uh, modify a virus to have a gene drive. So then when it goes out in the wild, it just infects all the other ones. And then, you know, they die really quick. Could you do that? I don't know if you could. I was just wondering. Well, so just, you know, for the listeners, uh, gene drive is uh, typically something that spreads through sexual uh, species that, and, and ideally ones that breed quickly. So these would typically be insects or rodents. Um, it doesn't wor work as such in viruses nor in uh, asexual bacteria, nor mm. in um, asexual plants and animals. Um, um, viruses already spread pretty quickly. Uh, 
I guess the question is, can you make a virus that will outcompete the other viruses? Or, um, you know, when the, when on the rare case that viruses exchange genetic material, will it win uh, in some sense? Uh, I think that's challenging, but possible uh, that you could. But the problem is that getting viruses that outcompete natural viruses sounds a little risky. And I think rightly so it's not going to be easy to fund and it should certainly if it is funded it should be done in glaring sunlight with a lot of people watching um and um you know a lot of different kinds of voices being heard about whether it should be done mm. or not. i think it, i think yeah. much more powerful than a gene drive and a virus or the equivalent in, in a non-sexual species is the virus the, is the vaccines is preparing our immune system for these viruses Hmm. And um, I know we're coming to the end. There's a um... oh, oh, also that the, we, we could do recoding, uh, which is hmm. which is the ultimate because that makes us resistant to all viruses rather than one at a time via vaccines. Some of which our immune system just doesn't remember it very well. Our immune system doesn't remember coronavirus or norovirus very well. Um, so so the multivirus resistance we get from recoding would be much more awesome also much harder <laughs> to get uh, implemented. Uh, is that something, uh, if we were to do like 10 years out, is that something you, like if, if like, so woolly mammoths five years ago was something that you were developing with mice and now you're developing it in the actual animal itself. 10 years from now, do you see um, stuff like that being something that would actually be in development um, in terms of like for humans? Um, I'm well, curious, like, what do you see for the next 10 years? It, I guess It depends on your definition of develop in development. It, it is in development mm. already. So, so yeah. I can with confidence say it'll be in development. <laughs> 10 years from now. Um, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that we could, if, if, if the rate at which we can do multiplex editing, you know, 25,000 today, maybe 250,000 tomorrow, uh, you know, a couple of years from now, uh, we could construct cell lines that are multivirus resi that are resistant to all viruses, just like we did for the industrial microorganism. And then we could use those cell lines to make cell therapies like hematopoietic stem cells, um, you know, you know uh, neurons in the brain and so forth, um, which are already happening uh, in a non-multivirus resistant way. So you could say... Um, any any cell therapy or organ therapy or, or transplant would be better if it were multivirus resistant. So you just pop that in as an option. It's like, you know, do you want bucket seats? Okay, check. Okay. And uh, 10 years from now, I don't know where, where it'll probably still be in development. Uh, it, it, you know, it is true that some clinical trials are now happening in one year rather than 10 years, but um, until that's very common. I, I hesitate to say anything it takes less than 10 years in, in mm. medicine. So then uh, one of the, the listeners wrote in and uh, it's a very personal qu uh, question. So I, I appreciate their courage in asking it. Um, they, were, they said, <clears throat> I have a disability called CRPS and mine is a result of an amputation reattachment resulting in multiple pain issues due to nerve damage, inflammation, other issues going on for the last 12, uh, 12 years. Um, is CRISPR something that could potentially uh, fix issues like that, or is uh, some, that something more like that would CRISPR be good for like regrowing an arm? Basically, we're wondering like, uh, what could CRISPR and genetic engineering technology do to alleviate the type of suffering he's going through? Or um, is it more like of the two branches, would it be easier to just regrow a limb, I guess, would be my way of, of summarizing it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Complex regional pain syndrome uh, mm. is a subset of pain in general. And I think there's been a breakthrough in pain um, in that we have pathways now that are non-opioid pathways, non-cocaine pathways um, that are based on sodium uh, channels um, that uh, actually reflect a person uh, are, are a set of people in the world that have chronic insensitivity to pain or SEPA. Uh, and so those could be harnessed. And, and those people are not doped up uh, the way you would expect of an opioid or a cocaine derivative. Um, they are, they're fine. Uh, so 
and you can make it local or you can make it temporary. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's that's happening. It could be small molecule drugs or it could be gene therapy. Uh, I don't put CRISPR on a pedestal, even though I did have something to do with it, you know, making it out there in the world. Uh, I think it's just one of a set of tools. And if you're going to be making um, transplantable limbs or organs, um, then it, CRISPR is not really the centerpiece of that. I mean, most of it is, you know, biological and tissue engineering, uh, and you're going to use a variety of editing tools uh, to, to, to get you there. If it comes from an animal, then most of the challenge is making it um, uh, uh, you know, compatible immunologically and physiologically. And, and I think we've handled that right now. We'll know soon we've got uh, two-year survival in, uh, in preclinical non-human primate trials. Uh, so that, that, that bodes well for getting it into human clinical trials very soon. Um, I think it, it, the insensitivity to pain was probably something that's better done with drugs than with transplants, uh, but there are plenty of cases where we will need to transplant limbs as well as, uh, I mean, there's a, unfortunately, there's still a lot of warfare in the world. There's, uh, you know, occupational and, uh, and car accidents and so forth. But, uh, but yeah, I, 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 my guess is the pain will come from progress in um, in uh, the sodium channel um, pain um, pathways and, and then completely separately will be uh, organ and limb transplants. And then um, are there books that you've read over the last couple of years they'd suggest people check out? I know your book, uh, based on all the longevity books, but um, the one thing that I'm doing is I'm compiling all the books that everyone's recommended in 170 plus episodes and I'm putting in a PDF for everyone to read. Uh, so this will be like kind of a nice bookend. But um, are there any books you recommend people check out? I think the first time we spoke, you uh, were a big fan of uh, what's his name? Hitchhiker's Guide of the Galaxy. I think uh, we, we, we quoted that back Adams, yeah, a few times. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But uh, yeah, is there anything else? Uh, anything you recommend people read either on aging, on biotechnology, just anything that you've enjoyed? Um. Yeah, I have a tendency to read books that are written by friends, uh, and, mm-hmm. and they asked me to write a blurb for the cover of the book. Uh, so I have a, kind of a bias. And, oh, and then mm-hmm. and then things that are complete fiction, um, totally off topic, um, uh, which, which is my wife and I read a, a, in, in an audible uh, stream uh, when we're doing chores uh, together. Um, I, I'm, what are, I'm writing a book. Uh, hopefully, that will oh, be cool. uh, on your on your bookshelf for your two uh, hundredth uh, episode. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I don't I don't have anything in particular that uh, it, it's. I think there's a need for more books on um, on the revolution that's occurring in synthetic biology, manufacturing, aging reversal, and so forth. Uh, probably that will be the more than adequately filled in the next couple of years. But uh, right now I think there's, there most, most of the books on synthetic biology are, you know, like biofuels, not terribly useful mm-hmm. and, or, and the ones on aging are, you know, like, you know, how to eat slightly better things, which again is not exactly news. Uh, you know, I might mention a few new brand names, but they're really not revolutionary. Um, I hope I'm not insulting any uh, authors or anything but I, I think it's it's we're just at this interesting transition zone where if you want to write a book that's not totally science fiction you have to stick to things that are a little bit boring uh mm-hmm. in years science fiction will become fact and then suddenly all the books will become exciting uh and it's not, it's not the fault of current or future authors it's just just the nature of scientific revolution I think that if you were to do like a crowdsource Kickstarter type thing to to write a book and you could just write it, you know, as advanced as you want, I think you'd get more than enough funding to write whatever you'd want. Like you oh, have like a, a team researchers too. It's not a financial problem. It's it's, it, it's okay. More, it's more a time management problem. Mm. Uh, I do, mm. as you pointed out uh, earlier, I, I do have a few things uh, that I'm doing um, that that limit my writing time. But but it, it's getting done. It's it's uh, it's getting done more and more quickly. 
And so just like what are what is like one fiction book that you're, you're reading or uh, audible reading? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, um, there's uh, there was one on a, a sort of Darwinian. It was the something of all things. Uh, uh, and it, it was it was about a, a woman, a, a, a fictional woman. Uh, contemporary of Darwin, who who had her own uh, very similar theory, uh, the signature of all things, and it, and it was mm-hmm. based on uh, this principle that that there was a signature that that uh, plants and animals would kind of tell us what their function is. It could be for medicine or something like that by their shape. Um, mm-hmm. That was that was part of it. It was much more complicated than that. It was, it was a little bit lovely story. It wasn't. I wouldn't call it a science. Uh, exclusively, but it had that little thread going through it that I thought was nice. Um, oh, uh, there was one by Andy Weir. Um, the Martian or the new one? Uh, the, the, the Martian, but there was another one, Hail Mary. Um, yeah. Uh, he also has I, Egg. What? Yeah, has, sorry, uh, there's a short story. I think it's called Egg, which is also pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, just very, those two are very creative and, and, and I think they're very kind of pro science. You sort of feel at the end of it, like that's, that's great. You know, they, they think out mm-hmm. of the box, they do stuff that needs to be done and so forth. So I, I thought those were, those were good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also the, a story of the dog barking at night, something like that, which was mm-hmm. written from the standpoint of a, of a, uh, autistic, uh, uh, child, older, older child, and it was. I just thought it was very well done. Uh, and it was a very inter- interesting mystery, kind of on a kind of a small, uh, relatable scale. Too, too many mysteries, you know, involve twelve murders, <laughs> and you just. This was, you know, nobody, no, no people died, and it, it just seemed like it was more relatable. Um, but even if you've never met or never known, you've met an autistic person. Um, now, not, not all these books are, are brand new, but, you know, I don't, I don't, mm. I, I, some books are so permanent, uh, you know, that they're, they don't need to be brand new. It's some, sometimes you miss it the first time through. Yeah. I'm reading, uh, like, uh, some Dostoevsky books and it's like, oh, this is nice. I, I prefer like the more like war and peace type Russian authors. Yeah. Cause they don't really Old have paragraphs. Uh, Dostoevsky. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. I, I didn't think of the, I didn't, couldn't think of the name. Uh, yeah, it's also like, like it's a little uh, like Dostoevsky is like he didn't know what a, like uh, indentation was. It's a little hard to know like where his thoughts uh, begin and end. But it is fun. I, I so I agree with your point that uh, you can go back and pick things up on the second time. Um, so someone someone did suggest that you know you might be qualified to apply for Calico Labs' new like CTO position, and I was like, you know what, you might you might have the skills, but I, <laughs> but I think you have enough things going on. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, I know we're going over. So then I'll. Um, just uh, I'll think of some books that would be good for you and I'll send them to you. But then, uh, so this was the Learn With All show. I suck at outros, so I do this together. I just want to thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, this is great. Um, and thanks so much for taking so much of your time, given like everything you got going on in your day. Well, this is very important to, to have a conversation with a broad set of voices that can um, feed back to, to, through you. Uh, so I think uh, happy to do it.